Well, welcome back, everyone, to Behind the Series. It's me, Pastor Mike, from Time of Grace. And once again, joined by who I consider like a, a sister in Christ and kind of like my funny, intelligent sister. Um, I'm not I'll take sure. it. <laughs> Amber L.B. Swenson is back. Amber, how are you doing today? I'm good. Can we update our listeners on your um, uh, physical status? Yes. In I case do... they haven't heard the big news. Yep. I can do seven push-ups now after a lot of training. <laughs> Just feeling good about That's the temple. That's exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you haven't heard, uh, in a tragic soccer accident, common to middle-aged men, I tore my ACL and meniscus, smashed my femur and tibia together. So I'm uh, awaiting ACL surgery here and a big pause on my soccer career, which has been 40 years in the running. So whew, trying to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, Amber. That is a good thing to do. Yeah. It is I indeed. too am injured, but... To a much less degree, oh. I hurt my shoulder two months ago. No. I've not been able to lift weights, and because our producer loves both of us, she has hurt both her shoulder and her leg, so that she can <laughs> empathize with both of us. So we are all wow. on the injured list, but none of us have quit smiling or thanking God. Yes. We are just hobbling along. Yes, so true. Hey, we are uh, back for another behind the series. We're talking about a series called Burned Out, yeah. and this was like one of the more practical. I was just reviewing the messages from the series like, oh, wow, this never stops being timely, even if you preach it yourself. So I'm excited to dig into it with you. I loved the series. I told Nia, our producer, I was like, this is in the top five of the series that you've done that for my favorites, mm -hmm. just because what you said, I think this is a series that pretty much everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. If you're not burned out now, you know what it feels like because you've been there before. Mm -hmm. So. Give us the big idea. Why did you want to preach on this? How did this come up? Yeah, I, I think what's the most common answer when you ask someone in America, how have you been? Busy. Busy. Isn't that interesting? Not good, bad, but busy. There's like just something baked in to modern American, especially Christian culture, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, modern is just technology moves so fast. We never really get away from anything, work, friends, American culture. I didn't know this. The average American works more than the average Japanese person, the average German person. We just have an like abnormally obsessed work culture. And then Christians who are supposed to have like, we're working for the Lord. We're serving other people in Jesus name. We, we kind of think, and I'm excited to dig into this within you, that to follow the example of Jesus means to push so hard that you basically serve other people until you die. <laughs> Are you dead yet? No, but you're coming on Saturday to volunteer. <laughs> you lazy. <laughs> what? You slept two hours. Jesus. Would... <laughs> yeah. So you combine those three things. And I think it's it's no it's no accident that for a lot of modern American Christians, that burnout is kind of our baseline response. I'm I'm busy. I'm exhausted. And it kind of robs us, I I think, of the life that God wants us to have. So yeah, let's dig into that together. Okay. So what would you say that burnout is? Is it just being busy or is there more than just your normal status busy? Yeah. Yeah. I would kind of define it as a level of busyness that strips us of the fruit of the spirit. Ooh. So if I'm so busy that I don't have any joy, I don't got time to sit down and count my blessings because I got to go. I don't have any peace because there's so much on my schedule and I'm so stressed. I can't be patient with you. Right. Because if my kid takes 30 seconds to put their shoes on, like we, we got a schedule to keep. I, I can't slow down for I don't have time to hurt my ACL. Like <laughs> when we're like pushing at a pace yeah. where we literally can't produce the fruit of the spirit. like that to me, that to me is the thing. Secular voices would say, you know, it's it's a physical thing. You can't catch your breath. You're anxious. You're impatient. So I think all that's true. And I'd add the the spiritual aspect on top of that, too. Nice. So what's the problem when we compromise rather than follow the rules? You mentioned in your sermon, a lot of times when we're burned out, we cope by compromising. Mm. So what's the problem with that? <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of us do that. So yeah. you might want to give us some examples of how we do this. Yeah. So I think if we just step back and we try to figure out what the best tools of science, like what, what does my body and my brain need? Um, you and I don't get to like come into this world and invent the rules. I'm going to be the kind of person who never needs to sleep. 
I'll choose option A, zero sleep. <laughs> like, no, there, there are some set rules that God is our creator kind of baked into our bodies. Mm -hmm. We need calories, we need energy, we need sleep, we need water. And, and compromise, I think, is where you look at the scientific rules and think, eh, no, I'm the exception. Yeah, sure, most people need that much sleep, not me. Um, yeah, maybe the average American needs ABC, but I, you know, I, I don't have to follow the same rules. Mm -hmm. And we kind of think that we're above the created order of things, which honestly you can get away with for a little bit. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people find that out that, oh, there's no immediate consequence if I sleep five hours instead of eight. It's not like I die. <laughs> and so you, you kind of get into these habits that you cheat the system for a bit. And then what so often happens to people, I've heard this from a lot of like pastors and, le and leaders, is that one day, boom, you just hit the wall and you go to see a doctor about it and, and they say you need six months off your job mm -hmm. like you have train wrecked your body because you've compromised the created order for so long and i love how you said in your sermon look there are seasons and we're not saying you know when you have a small child when you have an infant who gets up every two hours that's bad yeah. you can't do that no no i can't get up to take care of you there are seasons there are times in your life where that's your life yeah. and you you have to cope and you have to figure out how to get that nap in when you can, yep. but it's meant to be a season. It's not meant to be your way of life forever. And I appreciated that you gave that, you know, little note that like, Hey, Lewis, listen, we all have those seasons that sure. we're going to end up there with four hours of sleep yep. for a couple of weeks or whatever. But yep. yep. It has to be a season though, and not the status quo. Right. And when the exception becomes the rule like that's when you're on the fast track to burning out. Mm -hmm. Can I ask and you a really think, practical question before we yeah, jump? Yeah, yeah. Like, look, like where you're at now, when you think of how you take care of your created body, mm -hmm. let's just say to when you were 18 or 25, um, do you think that you've changed? Have, have you kind of grown in the wisdom of, oh, okay, here's how God made me not to run on hot Cheetos and dive on do <laughs> and you know, watching reality TV until one in the morning, which I used to do as a college student. Um, so yeah, do you think you've changed just in the practical way you treat your body? Yeah, I'd say I changed considerably in the last six months, in the last two years for sure. Um, for the record, I've never been a flaming Cheeto fan, so that was <laughs> never an issue. <laughs> and I always took health pretty seriously, but the sleep part was one that I didn't necessarily take as seriously. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was the nursing assistant for two straight years at the at the nursing mm -hmm. home. And I had to be at work at six and it was an hour away. So I was getting up at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge factor in me quitting is that I was living off of maybe five hours of sleep. And then I'd come home and I'd sleep on the couch for another two hours or so, but it wasn't full sleep, you know, whereas mm -hmm. now 1030 at night, I'm sound asleep till six or 630 in the morning. It feels great. I'm mm -hmm. a different person. My productivity is way better. My relationships way better. You know, just, I love reading. You know, I couldn't read before I'd fell, I fell asleep every time I opened a book before mm -hmm. because I was so tired. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about compensation because I think mm -hmm. this is the American way. I think that we tend to live in compensation mode. So what does that look like? Yeah. So if there's a created order that God created generally our bodies to need, and if we compromise that order, I'm going to sleep four hours instead of seven to eight. I'm going to eat this kind of food instead of that. I'm going to substitute like your your body starts to malfunction. Like you said, you sit down mm -hmm. and you fall asleep. So mm -hmm. compensation is there's a lot of things that I can do to compensate for the foolish choices that I'm making. So I can make a pot of coffee mm -hmm. and the caffeine will compensate for my lack of sleep. I'm working way too many hours. I can compensate by a, a couple of bourbons or a bottle of wine at night so I can deal with the stress. There's pills I can take. There's places that I can escape to. There, there's things that I can do that will kind of engage the, the dopamine and all the chemicals in my body to make up for the way that I'm not treating it on a regular basis. So what's wrong with that? <laughs> as long as you yeah. get through the day, right? As she hides the bottle of wine from her neck <laughs> while recording podcasts. Um, yeah, 
I mean, isn't that to... leading to burnout? Isn't it eventually going to lead to burnout? All those things are going to come at a price, right? Yeah. Every yeah. single one of them. Yeah, it, it spirals. It's mm -hmm. like if you're depressed, you could drink a lot and it would make you temporarily feel better. But alcohol is also a depressant, which will make you feel more depressed, which will make you need more alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not treating my body right, <laughs> it's like multiplying negatives. You know, we think it's going to make a positive. Oh, I'll just... I'll have a six pack of Mountain Dew every day to make up for my four hours of sleep. Like, uh, for a little bit you will. And then eventually it's gonna catch up with you. And there's, here's maybe a big point. And then there's gonna be people who have to take care of you because of your foolishness. Right. That Then your selfishness is gonna cost time, money, energy, inconvenience, because you won't face your, your own compensation and your mm -hmm. own compromise. Now other people have to pay the price and take care of you in your sickness and in your weakness. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I say in the message, try, behave like a creationist. If you confess the Apostles Creed, I, I believe that God created me, that there's a father who made me and things seen and unseen. Like, okay, you believe it, now behave like it. Yeah. Follow the rules that he created, make the status quo what science says your body needs. Nice, I like that. Okay, I found this very provocative. I hadn't heard this before, but you said that some of our character problems might actually just be physical problems. Mm. You remember saying that? I do, yeah. So first of all, explain that. Why are you saying that? Um, <laughs> so my wife, my wife's up at like 4 a.m., 3.50 a.m. almost every day, and if I try to have a, like a tense, maybe serious discussion with her after 8 PM mm -hmm. and you can just tell the discussion's not going well, she'll just look at me and say, I just need to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> like this will be, but the, the reason this isn't going well, isn't because of a lack of character in either of us. It's because there's a, a physical dynamic. Um, I think we're aware of this when we use the phrase hangry. Yes. Why are you angry? That's a character thing because I'm hungry, which is a physical thing. And so many times our patience or lack of it, our good communication or lack of it, our kindness or lack of it, our attentiveness to the word of God when you open that book or lack of it, is not just a level of faith thing, it's am I physically prepared to express my faith? Hmm. So yeah, I, I think character and physical choices are very, very closely related. I wonder if many people correlate those because that makes total sense. But yet so often throughout our day, we're praying for patience, you know, and we've gotten four hours of sleep and we're not seeing the correlation that maybe I should be getting more sleep, then I'll have more patience with my children. But yeah. we don't see that. And just saying that and having that awareness, it yeah. could really help a lot of people's attitudes. It could help their relationships. If we just, just take that nugget away and say, wait a second, what's going on in my life? Yeah. That could yeah. really help a lot of people, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. When I think about the Apostles' Creed, you know, it starts with the Father, the Creator, and then it moves mm -hmm. to Jesus, the Savior, and then the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier. It's kind of interesting to me that the first, the first part about creation, my body, comes before the third part, the Holy Spirit, yeah. my character. So uh, I, I wouldn't bet my soul on that interpretation, but that, that's really interesting. Like, yeah. You could have started with, hey, Jesus is my savior and the Holy Spirit guides me to a good life. And oh yeah, God the Father made me. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting where we start. This just makes logical sense when I think about when I tend to be a better Christian and when I tend to be a worse one. Okay, so I wanna talk about Jesus because you yes. brought Jesus into this. And actually that was fascinating. The email you had with your seminary professor and yeah. Jesus time off and all that. But Jesus kind of got this right. So, and he didn't have any character problems he had to deal with, but he got this right. So what are some of the lessons we can take away from Jesus, just from setting his life in, in light of the whole burnout factor? Yeah. So super cool. I'm a researcher and it struck me, Jesus was a devout Jew who followed the like worship pattern of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And I noticed he lived way up in Galilee. He didn't have a private jet. And there were three major Jewish festivals where he would have to, as a, a Jewish male, travel probably on foot all the way down to Jerusalem. And I thought, well, that, that couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't bring all the carpentry stuff with him. Like he was taking time off of work three times a year. And then there were the Sabbath days and then there were this and I actually printed this out. I want, I want to read it. 
Um, here's what the seminary professor, he's an Old Testament expert, he said, an observant Jew in Jesus's day could have had off 52 Sabbaths, one day for Purim, eight days for Passover, two days for Pentecost, two days for Rosh Hashanah, one day for Yom Kippur, nine days for the Feast of Tabernacles. Plus, Jewish men were supposed to show up in Jerusalem for Passover, the Festival of Weeks, and Pentecost, and it would have taken them some time to get there. And then if you're a farmer, the land is supposed to lie fallow for one year out of every seven, which is a whole year sabbatical for all farmers. Also note that Jesus's time off was literally time off, not time to cram full of activities, digital distractions, and the NFL, unquote. <laughs> yeah, so to think, I mean, I, I think where Christians, we feel guilty is we focus on the passage where Jesus served people, and he did. He said, greatness is putting other people first, mm -hmm. uh, being the servant, the slave, and treating other people like the master. But we take those passages out of the context of the Gospels where Jesus was observing the festivals. He was honoring uh, the Sabbath. He was getting away. Yeah, Let's get away from the crowds, Jesus would say. And so I I'm just asking Christians to believe everything that Jesus did, and not just the examples where he was physically working. What about the times when he was physically resting? Mm -hmm. And Matt, what a liberating passage and idea that is, huh? I feel like I should mention this too, because my daughter said to me one time, she was listening to my podcast and she's like, you know, it's kind of arrogant that you said you quit your job as if everybody could just quit their job, mom. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, um, every decision has a consequence. So you have to decide, is the money I'm making in this position worth what it's taking away from my family, taking away from my body, taking away from my relationships, taking away from my Christian walk with God, taking away from my ministry. And when you do all that, the pros and cons for a while, we said, yes, it is worth it in this, for this season, for this time, we had a wedding, we had a graduation, we had like things. And, and Steve and I said, yes, this is good. Mm. And then when those things were done, we said, done, <laughs> you know? Mm. And I think mm. it's so important to just mention that what do you value? I yeah. mean, really, what do you value? Because we can all work hard mm -hmm. and there is a time for that. There's a time when your family might say, you know, we're going to pick up extra hours at work because we want to go on a vacation to Iceland or whatever. So we're going to work really, really hard. And then, mm -hmm. but it's a, again, that season. Yes. But then there is something so important about not making money have the final say. Yeah. and looking at the value of all the other things that you can't ever get back. Last yeah. night, my family had a Bible study at home where my son and his wife came over and we've been doing it once a week. Hmm. And I make a big meal, I clean the house, I buy flowers, I make a big deal about it. Hmm. And we sit and we talk. That is worth so much more yes. than making hundreds of dollars at a job. Yeah, wow. You just can't get it. <clears throat> You're, you're so right. Uh, you, just after I preached um, this message, my wife and I, she, she made the decision to step away from full-time work. And Amber, I got to tell you this, I just had a date with Kim this morning and it has been one of the best decisions. She She's a great teacher. So she's still a part-time preschool teacher. Yep. Now she works 25, 30 hours instead of the 50 to 55 a week she used to work. But she has she has the space to go on a walk with her mother, who's a widow. Yes. With the best gift she can give is just spending time and talking and communicating. She has time to be with the kids during those teenage years where you learn more side to side in a car than you do face to face, mm -hmm. sometimes in a real conversation. She she has margin for being part of a life group. So yeah, you're right. Every decision has a consequence. And I think a lot of us don't realize we we have the power to decide. We, mm -hmm. we are not, there's not a gun to our head saying, if you don't keep working this job for the next 30 years, you're going to die. <laughs> like, no, you like embrace your agency, um, realize that you probably have a ton of options and just step back and, and look at the life that you have, the life that you want and decide accordingly. And wow, that's such an empowering thing to do. Yeah, totally agree. Awesome. Okay. Moving on the next one. The next sermon was burned out spiritually. Mm. And you mentioned the problem with, I have to, which is where a lot of us live. I lived there for a super long time. Why are you doing this? I have to. What's mm. the problem with that? <laughs> it's, oh, it's such a lie. You, 
maybe you have to to make that particular person happy. More likely you have to because you think you have to to make that particular person happy. Um, this was the part in the sermon where I picked up a bunch of really small dumbbells, a five pound, <laughs> a 10 pound. And like, eventually I'm holding on to so many pounds, it's it's too much for me. But I feel like, oh, if I put this one down, you know, this is so-and-so's thing. Or I've been volunteering here for six years and if I stepped away, it would all fall apart. Um, I can think of a lot of devout volunteers who are like the one, if, if I don't do it, who's gonna do it? Yeah. And the answer is, I don't know, but you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> like the kingdom of God will still come even if you don't do that and volunteer here. So if, if you, I would just say this, if you can't take care of the only body that God gave you, and if you can't fulfill the callings and you're the only person who can do that calling, no one else is Kim's husband. No, no one else is Brooklyn mm -hmm. and Maya's father. There's, there are no other people at my church who can do that but me. If we can't do the things that only we can do, like we got to push pause and say, okay, I don't have to. I'd like to do that if I had all the time and energy in the world, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm human. I'm created. I need this much sleep, this much rest. I need to take care of my body. And so if we could just recalibrate and say that the point of life is not to make everyone happy. The point of life is to be faithful to the callings that God has given us. Mm -hmm. Oh man, let, let's just start fresh with a blank piece of paper and let God dictate our schedule instead of our self-imposed demands and I have tos. Awesome. Okay, Jesus' words in Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. How can that help us with our schedule? Oh man, it's so beautiful. I love the gospel. I think the older I get, the more I'm like, wow, there's no one. Uh, in my life group last night, someone was saying just how much Jesus forgives. And we're saying, wow, it's so obvious in the Bible. And then another guy said, but there's nowhere else in the world where it works like this. Yeah. Like he just gives you the best stuff, even though you've done the worst things. And his total approval, you don't have to work for, strive for, you don't, you don't have to climb the ladder. You don't have to balance the scales. He just says, come to me, all of you who are weary, not if you're weary and a pretty good person or have logged. 15,000 volunteer hours. <laughs> like it's this free invitation of forgiveness and salvation and God's acceptance. And to me, that's just the rock we stand on as we make our schedule. If I know at the end of this week, whether I say yes to your request or no, that I'm approved of by God himself, like God is like, yes, I approve of you. Okay. Then that part of my heart that just needs to be liked and loved and approved of is all filled up with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's not desperately like trying to find that in my church community or volunteering or being the perfect mom or dad. It's just like, nope, that's all icing on the cake because I'm the cake for me is Jesus and he gives it free of charge. Um, so yeah, that invitation is just, it's so life-giving, not just for the forgiveness of sins, but for the actual change in my schedule that so many of us need. Yeah. Nice. Your last piece of advice is to actually schedule time with the gospel. Why is that the key to balance? I go back to what we just said. Um, if I don't have the gospel, which brings with it the approval of God himself, I'm going to go searching somewhere else for approval. And it turns out it's never enough. Mm -hmm. Like one of my really close friends, when I used to live in Madison, Wisconsin, he was like a rock star salesman for his job and he like broke his personal records. I forget if he broke like company records one year, worked his tail off. And do you know what the boss said to him the next year? Well, we got a new record to beat. It wasn't, wow, you knocked it out of the park. Take a break, man, that's amazing. Let's scale, no, like the, bo <laughs> the boss just turned like his personal record into the new standard. Yeah. And that's how the world works, right? You you win the championship with your team and now everyone's putting the pressure. Are you, are you gonna repeat? Mm -hmm. the, the world will not leave you alone. And so if you just start with the gospel, that here is a God who loves you so much, he sent his son that you could be accepted and enough and approved of in the sight of all the holy angels. Like that just, okay, so you're, what, you're a 22 year old person who doesn't think I'm good enough? Okay. <laughs> you're, you're disappointed in me because I'm not going to volunteer anymore. Okay. <laughs> like it's so, it's so weird to think that we like kill ourselves and become slaves for some singular person. 
like, no, 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 no. Like, I'll, I'll try to help you. I want to serve you. But everything I need, I've already found in Jesus and the good news of the gospel. And why is it that Bible reading so often is the thing to go? You know, when you're busy, it it's not Netflix. It's not scrolling through the phone. Yeah, It's not time out with your friends. Yeah. Why is it the one thing you don't get to in the day yep. I, is the I gospel? Because the word of God is a seed and not a piece of fruit. Um, I'm going to learn something this morning that's probably not going to like revolutionize my life as mm -hmm. soon as I get to the end of the page. Um, the word of God is like a seed and it doesn't come back empty, but it takes a little bit to produce fruit. And Netflix is better at like quick laughs and yeah. entertainment. And if I volu if I overextend myself, like I get your immediate approval that I can hear in my ears and see with my eyes, mm -hmm. I, I can't see God's approval. And so I think it's an act of faith that really believes that the word of God is more important than these things that I can see and touch. So yeah, walking by faith and not by sight, I think is the perennial battle. And it's the one we fight with our schedules. And if you actually do schedule the gospel, like you said, guys, you got to schedule this. If you schedule that time, you're investing in your future, mm -hmm. like in in huge ways to have those those fruit of the spirit, the peace, the patience, the joy. Yeah. When the Netflix is gone, when the phone is put down and you still feel a little empty and you're like, ah, uh, you know, yeah. still going to sleep tonight, not really feeling. Yeah. And like you said, maybe you don't <laughs> if you're reading certain parts of the Bible, maybe you're not all filled up and woohoo, yeah. you know, but you're investing yeah. in something down the line. You're building those spiritual muscles and it they'll come back, but it's yeah. not instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Third sermon. Yes. Burned out emotionally. You start with three lies that keep many of us burned out. It has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. They have to be happy and it's fine. So talk about the Apostle Paul's response to, it has to be perfect. Yeah. Um, when we try to be perfect in one area of our life, we end up not being faithful in other areas of our life. Yeah. So in 1 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul said, uh, it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So I think about that. If I, I This happens to a ton of parents, especially mom. Well, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I think this happens to a lot of moms. Totally. I want to be the perfect mom. I see all these examples, especially on social media of birthday parties and sweet 16s yeah. and what, I, what I'm doing for my kid. But if you, if you strive for perfection in that area, I have, I have a hunch that your husband's not happy. I have a hunch that your limited time, um, to be a wife has been over invested in your children. Um, I think if I'm trying to be a perfect pastor, Man, I could always pray more. I could always call someone up. I could always say, hey, happy anniversary. I could always say, how are you doing after his death? But if I try to be the perfect pastor and I overextend myself there, what, what kind of man will I be to Kim? Um, will I come home with time and energy to love her and to meet her needs and wants? So perfection is a trap. Mm -hmm. It sucks us in. It demands more of us than it should take. And it kind of robs us of faithfulness in other areas of our life. So we have to be okay with I'm trying to be a good mom, but I'm not going to be a perfect mom. Mm -hmm. If I tried to spend more time with you, son, I'd be terrible to your father. And I'm not going to do that. I, I met him first. I loved him first. <laughs> so I'm not putting you first. Like, no, my marriage is coming first. So I, yeah, the, for a lot of people who have very high standards, this is so tough because you, you will never be perfect in any area of my life, much less all of them. And mm -hmm. so be faithful, balance it well recognize that if you were better here, you'd be worse there and just ask God to give you a heart that's calm and at peace with that. Yeah. I um, made the mistake that a lot of parents make, moms make in that when my kids were young, you know, I wanted to have like the perfect birthday parties for them and I'd mm -hmm. make the super cool, you know, I made the boat cake for my son and the Barbie cakes for my daughters and had funky cupcakes that I made several years. And I finally realized and it took me far too many years to realize that I put so much time into the parties that I didn't spend any time with them on their birthdays at all. Hmm. That it would be from the minute they, I got up, I was like making all this stuff and then friends were coming over and it was, and then they'd be going right to bed. And I was like, I mean, I cooked and I cleaned and I brought kids home all day, but I didn't spend a minute just, with the birthday child. Mm. 
Mm. So, you know, they might have had a nice time, but yeah, that's not how I wanted to serve my kids. And I wanted to just get up and spend the day with them and hang out with them and not make it about that. But I think so many women struggle with that, whether it's Christmas, you know, you're having the whole family over and you want you want the perfect meal and you want the house clean and you want it decorated. And you put so much time into this that your heart has totally missed what Christmas is all about because all you're doing is preparation. You're doing the Martha instead of the Mary. And we do get so sucked into that. It's such a problem. I think, especially for women. It it is so hard. Um, Thank you for sharing that. That's spot on. I, I think I've told this story before. I'm not sure if I've told it to you. When I was a young pastor, did I ever tell you about the the guy who was so disgusted with my <clears throat> my work life balance that he said he no. physically got sick taking communion from me? No. Yeah. So I was a a new pastor, maybe a year or two in, <clears throat> and I'm trying to do all this stuff and, jo- and we had this big kind of ministry opportunity that I, I tried, and we just didn't have the resources to make it work, and so I stepped back. And there was a guy in our church who was really passionate about that area of ministry. And he was so not disappointed. He was disgusted. And he thought I was unfaithful to my call. Oof. And um, he, uh, he said, I'll never forget this. He sat down. He said, Pastor Mike, when you came to our church, I felt like a kid at a vending machine. And you were like this bottle of soda that was perfect. I mean, you had this talent and this one and this one. And I pushed the button. And here you came to our church. And now I realize as I reach for that bottle, that it was empty. Oh my. Oh, I am sorry. Yeah. So that that's not over. There there was an older pastor from our church, a retired pastor that he was good friends with, and he talked to this pastor to come in and uh not lecture me, but to persuade me to work more hours than I was working. And uh, the old pastor comes in. He, he was a good man, and he's talking to me. He, he's trying to find common ground and he's He's pushing me for a little bit like, hey, I I really think you need to you you need to put more into this. And Amber, I'm not kidding. In the in the middle of him talking, he pauses. And he breaks down weeping. And he starts confessing. I'm I'm just brand new to the ministry. He starts confessing of all the years when he wasn't there as a husband, when he wasn't there as a father. And I'm, I'm like watching this man, you know, 30, 40 years ahead of me thinking, this is probably one of the most important moments of my life. Mm-hmm. Like I, I am getting a glimpse 40 years in the future of the consequence of my decision right now. Yep. Do I want to be the beloved pastor who never disappoints people, but lives with tremendous guilt that I, I wasn't there for the calling that only I could do? Mm-hmm. Or do I want to disappoint someone? who says, you know what, you're, you're not the pastor I was hoping for, but I, I come home with no regrets. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not ashamed of the balance that I've had in life and it hasn't been perfect by any means, but man, if you're listening right now, just know that you're going to make a choice today that five years from now, 10 years from now, you're either going to be super proud of, even though it's hard, or you're going to be super ashamed of, and, and you will beg the next generation to either follow your example or not. Mm-hmm. So I think what Amber and I are trying to do is just like preach to you. Like we've been down that road. We've made (laughs) wise choices and foolish ones. Like, please, please, please find your approval in Jesus. Honor the created rules that your father gave you. And like, just be okay with wherever that leaves you. However people react for better or worse. Just know that you've made the best, wisest, most biblical decision. And I love how this is so emotional. I mean, these are not without the all these decisions are not without huge emotions and my kids right now as young adults they're at the age i like to say that my kids are now at the age where they lecture steve and i like you know maybe you guys could try to be a little more like this or do this one of the things that they said recently is could you guys not act like you're 80 because like my shoulder is hurting so I'm, I, I could only like lift my shoulder this far for a while. So I couldn't like lift anything. And then Steve's hip was going out. So we were hopping along. Could you, could you not act like you're 80? And we're like, we're trying guys, we're trying. But just last night at our Bible study, one of the things that our kids said is that the thing that they loved the most about dad growing up is he worked his three days a week. He's a nurse. He works 12 hour shifts. 
he worked his three hour, three days a week and he didn't do any more because he was there for their games. He was there for their field trips. He was there when they needed a ride home. All of a sudden they're like, can I go over to so-and-so's house? Can I, one of us was always. And, and so, like you said, in the moment, it can feel people are judging you. Well, they are judging you. I can't just feel that way. Like what's yeah. wrong with you? You only work three days a week. Well, yeah, I work nights and I have to sleep some and, and I'm there for my kids, but, but man, my kids are on the other end of that now saying it was so cool that dad mm -hmm. was at our games and yeah. that he was at our field trips and that he is in the pictures. Yeah. You can't get that back, man. I think it's a running theme of this podcast that Steve <laughs> is the rock star. Every time we talk, well, why don't, he should just take over for us and just like thoughts from Steve and he can, <laughs> he can, now I feel like I'm losing you, Amber. I'm reading. <laughs> He's a made up person. He doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm afraid to ever let him talk because if you think I don't have a filter, if you want to know the truth on anything, <laughs> you ask Steve Swenson, he will give it to you. True facts. So he will never see a mic. Oh man. Well done, Steve. The more, the more I hear about Steve, the more I just have a ton of respect for him. I'm sure he has his issues too, as you know, oh, but does. man, it sounds like he, it sounds like he gets the big things, right? He does. And he's yeah. kept me in line, which is no small tasks. So. <laughs> in our family, we tend to say it's probably fine. This happened. This started last year at my son's wedding. I was a, a month before the wedding. It's like, it suddenly hit me that my son was moving out. It, it didn't for one second until like right a month before. And I could not stop crying. I mean, every day I just cried. I just realized that he's moving out and he's never moving back in. And this is the end of his childhood. And he's starting his own family. He's his own man. And he's like all these things. And I could not stop crying. Steve tried to help me. My kids tried to help me. Simon actually came to Steve and said, dad, there's something really wrong with mom and I don't know what to do about it. And Steve was like, it's okay. It's okay. She's a mom and she's just watching you get married for the first time, for the first time, for the, for the first child that's ever gotten married. <laughs> but I mean, I, I was able to get through it and I high-fived him going out the door that last day and we made it. But that's when this whole probably fine started because his friends would see me start to cry and they're like, it's probably fine, which it was not fine. It was like, there was nothing that was fine. The day of the wedding, the first time I saw him, you know, they brought me up in a little go-kart to see my son and I, he turned around and he's wait, wait, wait. in a go-kart. Were you no, like, no, it's a golf like cart. Mario golf cart. cart. <laughs> golf cart. The, mo go -kart. the mother of the groom and a <laughs> Anyway, is there someone? I can I can I ask AI to just produce me an image of Amber Elby Swenson in a go kart, in like a, a <laughs> in a dress? It was ninety eight degrees. It was hot, hot, hot. But I see him in a tuxo, tuxedo, and I just start losing it. And all the groomsmen mm. are like, "It's probably fine." I said, "After today, if I hear anyone say it's probably fine, literally, I'm just gonna smack you because it's not fine. Like I'm having an emotional breakdown here. It's not fine." Mm -hmm. But you said too, so often we say it's fine and that's not necessarily what we should be saying. That's kind of a, a warning that, that, that has, that's not a long-term coping yeah. mechanism. Yeah. So what are you hoping that people take away from this sermon yeah. and this sermon series? Oh yeah. When I think of the Proverbs, like the wisdom of the old Testament, I think the the foolish person in the Proverbs says that a lot. Yeah. Hey, aren't you concerned about, ah, whatever, it's it's fine. It's a way of almost like deflecting, like, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to try to convince you that I'm making a smart decision. I just want to shut down the conversation so I don't have to like really think about the choices I'm making and their consequence. And so I, I think that's what I want out of this series is instead of just saying it's fine, whatever, I haven't crashed and burned yet. Let's just step back. Let, let's think about what we know. Let's think about what the Bible says. Let's humble ourselves before the scripture and the science that tells us about our bodies. And let's figure out if it's fine or not. It might be. Yeah. Maybe you're in a great spot 
or maybe this sermon series is going to be God, you know, waving at you to slow down before it's too late. He loves you. He wants to save you from that crash. He wants you to have a great relationship with Jesus. If you're married, he wants you to have an amazing marriage. If you're a parent, man, he wants you to have a close relationship with your kids. So this might sting and it might change some things, but I just want you to know if God is waving his arms at you, he it's because he's saying it's not fine and I want it to actually be fine. Nice. Okay. The last sermon this month is forgotten blessings. Mm. And you reminded of us of Ephesians 1, 3, which tells us that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Yes. And a lot of people might listen to this and go, wait, 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 wait. I don't feel particularly blessed. I mean, I, I believe that Jesus is my savior, but mm. I don't feel super blessed spiritually. So what would you tell them to look for so that they can identify these blessings in their life? Mm. So I had a kind of a snarky college professor who <laughs> you could take this in the wrong way, but he, I can still 25 years later, I can still hear his impression. <laughs> oh, but pastor, I, I really feel <laughs> yeah, he, he just knew that more heresy follows that phrase than almost anything else. Yeah. I feel uh, okay. Feelings are real. They're valuable, but they're not all true. And I would say if, uh, I mean, just read Ephesians one verses three to 14, grab a highlighter and let, let God speak to your feelings. Cause if you do believe in Jesus, you are chosen, predestined, saved, redeemed, loved, blessed, safe, guarded, treasured, liked, approved of, accepted, cleansed, holy, like God. No, you're not, you're not healthy and you're not wealthy perhaps. But if you have Jesus, you have like the top 99 best blessings that you could actually get in this life. Mm. So turn to the spiritual, turn to the eternal. And if you have Jesus, you have all of it. Beautiful. And then you explain the blessing, which so many of us take for granted. We do. We hear it every week. The Lord bless you and keep you. And we're like, hmm. it's like the Lord's prayer and so many other things, you know, where we don't put a lot of time into thinking, what yeah. does that mean? But you really talked about what it means when you say the Lord bless you and keep you. So what does yeah. that mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, I think you and I attend churches where the service ends with um, a famous blessing from Numbers chapter six, but maybe not everyone does who's listening. So do you remember the exact quote of how, like, what have you heard for all these years? The Lord bless you and keep you, you mean? Yeah. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the blessing Amber's referring to. Yeah. That phrase, the Lord bless you and keep you. Um, it's, it strikes me that even though the devil is working like crazy to make me not a Christian, God kept me a Christian from yesterday until today. Like how much deception, how many lies, how many other options, how many sins could I be getting used to and living in instead of resisting and repenting of? How many other religions could I believe in? How many other philosophies could I embrace? The fact that that you and I repent of our sins today and believe mm -hmm. that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven, like that, that is an amazing miracle that a very small percentage of humanity has. Yeah. So, okay, maybe my ACL didn't miraculously heal while I was sleeping. But I woke up and I still believed in Jesus, which is as good as it gets if every spiritual blessing is connected to Christ. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've, I grew up in a church where every single Sunday we heard that blessing, the Lord bless mm -hmm. you and keep you. And I never thought about that last phrase. Yeah. Like, wow, God, God's keeping is actually the best blessing. Yeah, I, I, I too. And when you started talking about it, I was like, wait a second, I don't ever think about that at all. <laughs> And that is a miracle, like you said, every day. Yeah. How you, and it reminded me of I don't know, was it Elijah or Elisha when his servant was out and the the hillside was surrounded, you know, with angels and yeah. all these forces that every day we go through our day and we don't realize how hard God is working on our behalf. You yeah. know, we're just do to do to do to do. <laughs> yes. Here we go. And God's up there like. You know, <laughs> this way and this way, and uh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm picturing like the open manhole cover, and like an angel pushes it. So like he just had to do. 
<laughs> so yes. true. I mean, but that in itself is such a beautiful thing that we don't think about very often. And it's just yeah. uh, one more reason to give thanks. Yeah, so true. Man, God is good. Oh, man, I can't believe how fast the time goes. We're almost out of time, Amber. Thanks for some insightful questions. Thanks for going deep and, and being personal with the series. Um, yeah, if you're listening, not only do we want you to catch these messages, especially the Burned Out series, but we have a brand new book. Um, it's called Beyond Burnout. It includes uh, just some more of the messages that you heard in this series and an additional Bible study so you can dig deeper. So I love how Amber said in the beginning, um, this is just universally applicable. So single, married, parent not, working in ministry, working somewhere else, retired. Like, man, th this is just something pretty much all of us in American culture need to hear. So make sure you jump over to timeofgrace.org and uh, check out that brand new book called Beyond Burnout. So good to talk to you, Amber. Uh, if you're listening, have a great Easter, a blessed season, and we'll catch you next time on Behind the Series.